Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sailing wax, but about how, what and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. And here in my studio is my pretty bride, Ravinder. So, Rav, say hello to everyone and share your special insight for the day. And please tell everyone how they can learn more about our show. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Special insight for the day, probably stay warm. We have sub-freezing temperatures right now. So take care. Take care of yourselves and, you know, stay nice and warm, unless you're in a nice warm place anyway, in which case enjoy the sun for me. Um, If you want to learn more about the show, we have a website that is provocativeenlightenmentradio.com. You know, if you go check that out, you can see all of our art archives and you can you know you can play the show non-stop for quite some time and learn a whole bunch of stuff uh, we also have a facebook page as well uh, so any information that gets given out on the air any special orals that the guests may uh, may bring up then we'll post that up there for you so just search for provocative enlightenment radio on facebook and you'll find us now you probably ought to let everybody know since this broadcast is live in seattle that our studio is connected remote to the Seattle station, that we're actually in Spokane. You don't want people driving down the road in Seattle thinking freezing temperatures. What are they talking about? That that is very, very true. This is the time of year that I want to move over there. No kidding. (laughs) I don't know that the time of year ever changes for that, but all right. In this week's Spotlight, I'd like to discuss... Hermeneutics, or the branch of knowledge that deals with interpretation. Recently, I had the opportunity to discuss with a friend our recent show with Professor Patrick Grimm. At one point in our conversation, Grimm suggested that he was becoming more and more inclined towards perspectivism, the idea that perception, experience, and reason change according to the viewer's relative perspective and interpretation. I referred to the work of Nietzsche, and particularly his Will to Power essay, and his view of perspectivism as a hermeneutical philosophy, or the idea that our understanding of the world is built in a loop. That is to say, we engage with a phenomena of the world, a part of life, and this challenges our understanding, which triggers reflection and or reinterpretation aimed at greater understanding which raises the need for meaning. And this need for meaning is projected through our action or speech, which in turn leads to our engagement with that part of life again. In other words, much of our understanding of the world and ourselves for that matter is circular in nature. This process creates our expectation, which leads to our interpretation of our perception And that confirms our understanding, and this circularity continues over and over again. Indeed, much of what we call confirmation bias originates and is reinforced by this sort of circular mechanism. We tend to hear or interpret information according to our bias, and we build models of the world out of this. All of our understanding is based on the models we have constructed or adopted. The models themselves are based on assumptions that may or may not be true. This is as true of much of science as it is of our personal beliefs. If our models are wrong, then so are our conclusions. A recent spotlight that we did on this show was all about certainty. Bottom line? There is very little of anything that we can be absolutely certain of. Understanding the nature of hermeneutics informs us of just another way in which uncertainty is certain. 
My friend rejected the idea of uncertainty and perspectivism, for it makes the world too complicated. Perhaps Grimm's words regarding free will prompted this rejection when he said, quote, I must believe in free will in order to live, close quote. I get that. What he did not say was that free will actually existed. Instead, he admitted the importance we all place on believing that we have free will. In fact, he went on to add the caveat that we might just need to redefine free will, for it wasn't the same as most people think. It's not simply a matter of choosing which piece of paper to ride on or what amusement park to visit. It's much more complicated than that. Decisions are often made in the unconscious, and our act of conscious will is only a manifestation of what our unconscious has decided beforehand. I am reminded of a recent discussion with Professor Joel Weinberger. Weinberger is a leading authority on the unconscious. In his words paraphrased, there is no such thing as conscious activity separate from unconscious processes. When we think of ourselves understanding the role the unconscious plays in our lives and the nature of how we build models or our personal hermeneutic philosophy, it's reasonable to accept the idea that much of what we know, in quotation marks, may be entirely false. To that end, every week I implore you to be willing for or uncertain, be willing to be uncertain for an hour. There you have it. Your thoughts, Ravinder? Well, I'm an expert at being uncertain. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, no, it's um, it's all interesting. It's all interesting stuff. I thought a great deal, I suppose, about free will and, you know, looked at those arguments backwards and forwards. Um, it's the stuff that you have to pay attention to because it adds a whole different dimension to your life. It, it, yeah, thinking is good for you. Today thinking we're is good talk for about you. Mathematics, to some extent, and how algorithms, uh, calculations, actually determine human value. And if you think about that, you think about the statistical nature of the underlying argument, which essentially says that we're going to do or behave in a certain way because of the grouping to which we belong. We'll get into that in a great deal more detail. But if that doesn't say there's a whole lot less free will in quotation marks, well, then the numbers must all be wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last show featured Professor Daniel Markovitz, and we discussed his work and book, The Meritocracy Trap. It's an important book, and if you haven't read it yet, do so. Marianne wrote, I wish I knew how or what I could do to change the inequalities Markovitz discussed. Terry wrote, I will never again think of merit rewards in the same way. Thanks for the show. John wrote, because of my work, I listen to talk radio or podcasts every day. For most shows, I know what to expect. But with your show, I never do. One week, it's a philosopher espousing the virtues of stoicism. And the next, it's a scientist talking about consciousness. The one thing I do know about your shows, they're always interesting. They get me thinking. Keep on doing what you do. Well, thank you, John. Moving on, Shelley wrote, I'm currently using InterTalk Unlimited Personal Power. I'm feeling a huge shift in my focus and my drive to accomplish my projects and goals. Ovi wrote, the best explanation of limiting beliefs, the box of beliefs we all have, and one of the best tools to get out of it, InterTalk. And I speak from experience. I've used speaking in public and self-confidence programs with great results after a week. Highly recommended. Finally, Marta wrote, Thank you, Eldon. I may have never met you, but for your CD, but your CDs have been fabulous. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, thank you, Marta, and back at you. What do you think of those letters, Rav? I think they're brilliant. That makes everything worthwhile. 
All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but please keep your comments coming. We do sincerely appreciate your feedback. You can opine by sending me an email at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. Now to today's show, and I've been looking forward to this one. Ultimate Price, the value we place on human life with Professor Howard Friedman. I'm not sure, is that Friedman or Friedman? Ravinder? I think it's Friedman. All right. We can double check with him as soon as he's with us. Okay, so (laughs) let me tell you a little about today's guest. Professor Friedman received his bachelor's degree from Binghamton University in Applied Physics. He earned a master's in statistics and a Ph.D. in biomedical engineering from John Hopkins University. Friedman took a position as a director at Capital One, where he led teams of data scientists, statisticians, analysts, and programmers in various areas of operations and marketing. He later formed companies that provided consulting services in areas of designing, developing, and modeling data. In short, Friedman is a data scientist, health economist, writer, and artist, and he teaches at Columbia University. All right, on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Howard Friedman. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. Am I saying that correctly? Is it Friedman? You said it perfectly. Okay. I I mean, all right. We like to learn three things from our guests on this show, Doctor. What is the message? Who is the messenger? And how do we use the information? To that end, please share with us what you're passionate about and why. Well, I'm certainly passionate about data and data analysis, but the why is because we can save lives, we can improve lives. Um, In my particular case, I've applied it in areas related to health, related to education, of course in business as well. But I think the key thing for me in the conversation today is really making sure people understand how data analysis and modeling is used to put price tags on human lives. And to understand that these price tags aren't always fair and that we should get involved. We should understand the unfairness because lives that are less valued are less protected. So there's an inherent thing that is really should be motivating all of us to understand how our lives are being valued, how someone is putting a price tag on our life. I found your book to be... uh... A disturbing read, forgive me, but also... <laughs> That's a compliment, you know, I, right? <laughs> I, 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 it is. It really is. It, it was something I could not put down, and I highly recommend it to all of our listeners. Uh, this is a must-read book, uh, The Ultimate Price. Uh, all right, you heard today's spotlight, Professor. How much of human behavior do you think is really consciously thought out And more importantly, does this element of humanness ever figure into actuarial assumptions? So I I was listening closely, and I have to admit I was taking notes um, because, you know, as you were describing it, I kept thinking not just of individuals and how our, our learning is very much circular, starting with our own framework and making little tweaks and iterations to it, but groups. And, you know, there's a very famous uh, paraphrase of the physicist Max Planck who said science progresses one funeral at a time. Uh, the point being that not just individuals, but whether it's scientists or, or political leaders, we naturally challenge results and assumptions that are counterintuitive and things that agree with our own predispositions. We simply you know, check off the box and move on. And what happens is, in my, in my opinion, is that radical or external viewpoints coming from a different angle are often extremely challenged and disco- uh, discouraged by collective expertise. And in particular, I think it's your, your, your preview topic is very pertinent for, to Ultimate Price because I spend a lot of time in that book challenging the science, challenging the data declaring where is there a lack of information, poor understanding, limited ability to model. Uh, And so obviously, you know, I think scientists and researchers who also work in this area of whether it's 
health economics, whether it's in the actuary sciences, all these different elements that value human life, some of them will probably be displeased because I'm pointing out so many of the limitations that they don't like to necessarily talk about uh, so openly with the public. But I think it's important. I think that non-technical experts should understand there's a lot of groupthink that happens and not all the group groupthink is right. Amen to that. And I think you did an excellent job. And perhaps that's one of the reasons the book is as provocative as it is. Uh, but before we get into your book, on a personal note, in addition to being a data scientist and educator, you're a poet and an artist. And I tried to get your book, Angels and Stardust, but it, apparently it's out of print. Um, <laughs> as you all know, the great bestsellers are, you... Uh... <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, you know, what, we'll, okay, I'll, I'll want, get you a copy, okay? That's my well, personal promise That would be wonderful. You. I wanted to look at personal your art. Promise. I mean, you studied art at Binghamton, Binghamton, I'll get that said, University, and the School of Visual Art. Uh, uh, it's and in rare. fact, I was just touching up a painting about 20 minutes before this call started. <laughs> How wonderful. That it would tell me. I mean, we like to, you know, we like the personal side of our guests. What What are you more passionate about? Which skill set? That right brain, you know, artistic ability, or that left brain mathematical skill? I mean, honestly, I, I genuinely love both. Um, I can't pay the bills with my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did, uh, I did sell a few paintings along the way, but I, I can't pay the bills that way. Um, but for me, the art component is—it's a release. It's a catharsis. It allows me just to free myself from other constraints. Uh, you know, when I do statistics or health economics, there's a lot of rules in place. But when I'm painting, and I. I switched. I used to do more representative painting. I've been doing abstract painting for the last, gosh, 15 years. Well, all the rules are out. I can just put together whatever I want. And then when I decide it didn't work out, I let the paint dry and go another layer on top. Uh, so it's it's just a very different engagement, a different environment. And uh, it it's very satisfying. And your poetry, I, I believe, it, I know it was Poe that said something like, uh, with me, poetry, uh, my eye to poetry has been to uh, praise the art you know, without an eye to the paltry commendations uh, of mankind. Um, how about your poetry? Uh, what kind of poetry well, I, do you write? <laughs> so I, I haven't written poetry in, in decades unless you count the very clever nursery rhymes I work on with, uh, <laughs> with the kids in the areas. Um, but I, I guess I... Uh, I'm getting pretty good at writing well for three and four year olds. Um, but at the time, it actually had a similar, I guess, feeling, not just emotionally, but physically, as I just described the artwork, which was it was a catharsis. It gave me a way to express myself that I couldn't do through my science. And so, um, you know, some of the work that I wrote, and, you know, this is a long time ago. Uh, some of it I, I cringe at when I read today, and some of it I look and say, I still like it. And um, that's pretty good if decades later, even just a small percentage I still like. But um, truly, it's really about, for me, the not just the ability to express kind of my, my innermost feelings, but also that, that release, that, that freedom that I get from creative writing or or whether it's painting or some other aspect which my science career doesn't give me well i relate to that i mean so my earliest published work was all poetry and i found poetry to be uh, a marvelous escape mechanism but i think all writers will look back at what they wrote 10, 20, 30 years ago and be critical of it because that's just the nature of how we grow. I am going to hold you to that copy of your book that you promised me. Before we dive into your work, sir, Ultimate Price, I have a personal interest in one of your earlier contributions, the book The Longevity Project. 
Your book attempted to answer the question, who lives longest and why, based on personality traits, relationships, experiences, and career paths. Your book turned many heads because the data tended to disagree with some long-held views. For example, married people do not live longer. Indeed, you claim that eating vegetables and going to the gym are not as important to our long-term health as having a rich, productive life. You talk about your own mortality awareness in terms of what you call the high road. Please unpack this for our audience. What is the high road? Well, you're going to find this extremely funny. So there is a Facebook club that's called That's a Different Howard Friedman because it's a very common name. And while I'm the author of Ultimate Price and I teach at Columbia University and I do write poetry and paint, that's a different Howard Friedman. <laughs> oh, it is. This is it's not a, Howard that, Stephen Friedman. Uh, well, he's a he's, he, he is Howard S. Friedman, but that's a different professor. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Then I I mean I conflated it's what it came down to. You know, we do our own <laughs> I, homework. He's a and very, he's we a very do the backgrounds, and, and I would right. love to take credit for his work. Um, but no, that's it's also a Howard S. Friedman, but he's based out of uh, University of California, and he's uh, he's also a different uh, generation than me. I'm I'm a, a generation younger. All We're right. Not really, so we'll we'll pass on the high road unless you think of something you want to add in later as your own high road, okay? Sounds good. Let's, let's get a couple of tough ones out of the way. I think we all get that someone somehow must value human life in terms of dollars and cents. As distasteful as that might be, something such as a wrongful death suit must eventually have some way of valuing the life lost. Now, if this is not distasteful enough, when you consider the manner lives are valued, we see some stark differences between people. On the basis of things like race, why is this? And please flesh out any alternatives to today's methods that you might suggest or that might exist. So I, I think it's first worth stepping back to, to recognize that human life is valued in many different areas. Um, the regulatory system puts a price tag on human life when they try to understand the trade-offs between investing more in the environment, uh, such as reducing the allowable arsenic in the water, and the benefit in terms of the life saved. Companies will do this all the time as they look to try and figure out how much should they invest in safety versus how much they may have to pay later in lawsuits and regulatory fines and damage to their brand. Health insurance companies have to do this as a function of their business. And, and of course, life insurance companies are doing this daily as well. Uh, so there's many different aspects in which it comes in. In particular, any situation where someone is building a price tag on human life that involves an input of income or wealth will have infused in it some racial biases or some gender-based biases because there are known biases in salary data. For example, there is a the gender wage gap. It's very well documented that men and women, similar education, similar experience, uh, similar number of years of working in the same industries. On average, there is a gap uh, between what a man earns and a woman earns. So you're valuing human life based on income. By definition, you're going to penalize women. Racial pay gaps are also very well documented, whether it's at a, a high school level, college level, or master's degree of education, blacks and whites on average have a substantial pay gap on the scale of 25% or so. So if you just used income as an input, you're propagating and reinforcing these salary gaps, which are just clearly truly unfair. And as a result, you're not valuing that person's life as much. But there are alternatives to it, which I'm sure we'll get to in the discussion. All right. Well, we've got a break coming up here. But when we come back, before we jump to those alternatives, um, 
I guess I'll ask you after the break because I don't have the time for it. But the question is going to be, you have a young, say, black child, and you have a wrongful death lawsuit. And this young black child is going to be, his, his life is going to be valued largely on the fact he belongs to the group we call black people. I'd like you to break down how much of group uh, is there involved in, in, in valuating human life. When we get back, we're speaking with Professor Howard Friedman about his work and book, Ultimate Price, The Value We Place on Human Life. And I'm going to tell you, you want to get and read this book. Uh, it's an important read, and, it, and, and there, are, there are things that we all can become involved in in changing the way some of this is done. You can learn more about our guest in his book by visiting howardfriedman.com. Now, that's howard dash Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N dot com. Okay, do please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, Inner Talk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love Inner Talk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used Inner Talk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your Inner Talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Howard Friedman about his work and book, Ultimate Price, The Value We Place on Human Life. You can learn more about our guest and his book by visiting howard-freeman.com, howard-freeman.com. All right, every week we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some real significance to them. Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. It's also an avocation of mine, and you all know that by now. So, Professor, your chosen music is Shelter from the Storm, performed by Bob Dylan. Please tell us, why is this music important to you? And more importantly, how does it inform us about who you are? Hmm. Well, I I have many different types of music I enjoy. Um, that particular artist, Bob Dylan, and and that song, I think it's it's just a wonderful vision of poetry in motion. The music tells a story, but a story that goes back and forth in time. And I think back to our groupthink conversation. You know what we started this with the notion that Bob Dylan would win a Nobel Prize in literature was considered to be somewhat of a, a, a crank idea back in the 80s and, and 90s, uh, you know, when I was in school. Right. People who suggested it, they said, well, you don't understand what literature is. Um, yet, obviously, he won. And as my mom jokes, and my mom uh, saw him in Cafe Wa way back, I think probably 1961, 62. She said, and the way Bob responded to receiving that Nobel Prize will guarantee that no other singer will ever win one in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Sir, just before we went to break, uh, I, I mentioned this idea of groups. So let me see if I can set that up again. Let's say we have a wrongful death uh, action, 
and we have maybe a six or seven year old black child uh, from an average family. Um, ascertaining what that earning potential may have been, uh, therefore what this life might be worth, throwing the math to it, he's going to get treated in a group. Am I right or wrong? Um, it won't work exactly how you're proposing. So let me let me shift over to uh, talk a little about crime, and then we'll get right back to this point about civil courts, because I, I think you'll see the, the dots connecting a little bit differently. Okay. So, so because groups really are uh, critical in the analysis, but the group kind of uh, doesn't really shape exactly the same way depending on what is the system and how lives are being valued. So if we go to the, our our criminal court system, of course, you know, we state that uh, justice is blind. And that's a, it's a powerful statement. Regardless of who you are, you should receive the same treatment in front of the law. Well, but that's not uh, true. So back to cases involving how human life is valued, it, we can take the extreme case of murder. And the punishments for death penalties are far more likely to be applied when the murder victims are white and the murder is black than in the other situation. Race is playing a role in how our criminal justice system operates. It, another extreme example, one that really is also counterintuitive, is vehicular manslaughter. Someone's driving a car, an accident happens, someone dies. Maybe it was someone walking on the side of the road, maybe it was someone else in a car, but this is somewhat of a random crime. Yet, there are shorter jail sentences if the victim was black or unemployed. Now, clearly, justice is not blind if who the victim was plays into what the punishment is. So Correct. now, taking that concept, now let's move it over to this whole idea of valuing a human life. And uh, it's important for me, and I think this is coming from a little bit of my, my background as a scientist, is I like to look at the extreme cases, because that tells you where there's tremendous inequalities and where the holes are. So, O.J. Simpson, of course, loses the civil suit against Goldman and Brown. And mm -hmm. as a result, there's a record settlement. $33.5 million is the settlement. A tremendous value is assessed to the loss of the lives of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown. Contrast that with Cheryl Thurston. Cheryl was disabled. She required 24-hour care. She was in a care facility. The care facility left her alone in a bathtub. She slipped into a coma. Within 24 hours, she died. Her sister sued the care facility, and the judgment in New York State for this wrongful death suit was that, yes, the facility was negligent with an award of zero dollars because Cheryl Thurston was not earning money. She was costing money. She, in the terms of New York State, had not suffered because she was unconscious for the 24 hours between the coma and death. And, as the judge in the case said, had Cheryl been chattel, for example, like a cow or a chicken, then her sister could have received some money for the death. But there's no intrinsic value in the loss of human life. Now, that's an extreme difference. Zero dollars for Cheryl Thurston, 33.5 million settlement in the O.J. Simpson case. That's the example of the incredible ranges. Now, you had framed this question asking about uh, a child, six, seven years old, wrongful death, um, and how race might play into it. it. It wouldn't be so obvious of someone saying, well, this individual, this is what they would have earned there for. They, it, they would have a difficult time defending that. And so population averages are usually used but at a higher level. And let me describe what I mean by that. Okay. After September 11th, there was a victim's compensation fund that was created. In the compensation fund, some people 
the families of some of the victims were paid over $7 million. Meanwhile, the families of some of the victims were paid $250,000. The main driver in that difference was how much was the person earning. The top earners were then, you know, the families of those victims were then given the top payments. But for the children who died, they simply said, well, what was the average expected earning of anyone at this time period? They didn't try to do some racial stratification or gender stratification. And I think that's typical of what you would see in a civil court because the special administrator, Kenneth Feinberg, was instructed to use economic principles. And he did a little bit, but he tried to put in elements of equity into his calculations. Instead of the zero dollars that Cheryl Thurston's life was valued at, he said there's a minimum number. And so he put it at 250000 We could argue maybe it should have been a lot higher, but he required a minimum number. And instead of that $33.5 million that was used to value Goldman and Brown, he said, I'm going to cap the number. So he tried to bring those down a little bit. And I think, you know, as we talk more about different ways to value life and how to make it more equitable, a little bit of what he introduced way back on the September 11th Victims Compensation Fund, it hints at really where the most equitable solutions are probably found. So basically you're saying historically the courts have ruled, at least in the one case, that there is no intrinsic dollar value to a human life. It's just it's zero. Well, New York State. <laughs> different states have different rules. And so you know, to the point about the state dependence, California allows for consideration of the income and wealth of the person being sued when coming up with a settlement. So while OJ never earned that much money in his life, he was a multi-multi-millionaire. So right. different states, different rules. In New York State, there is no intrinsic value for the loss of human life. All right. Algorithms and machine learning systems today are capable of predicting a lot of human behavior. Given certain demographic or psychographic information together with the historical data, what role does artificial intelligence, machine learning, and algorithms play in calculating the value of human life, Professor? Okay, great question. And uh, full disclosure, I teach machine learning at Columbia, so I, I, I live this world a bit. Um, in different areas, they'll play different roles. And let me describe them a little bit more for you. When we talk about life insurance, in, in the case of life insurance, you're putting a dollar figure on your own life. So it's very empowering in that sense. You, you decide how much you want coverage for. And usually it's based on what's the monthly you can pay. <laughs> and then maybe it's your expected need. The model underneath that, that assesses what is your mortality risk, is very much a data-driven model and many of them are advanced machine learning models, trying to do the best assessment of risk based on all of the data that they can gather, not only about your family and your health, but perhaps some of your hobbies, other behaviors, other factors that predict the probability that you're going to survive the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. In other spaces, such as in healthcare, machine learning applications are currently very engaged in, for example, trying to figure out what is the best oncology treatment for someone with your genomic profile and matching that together. And the better they can match it, the more likely you will survive, maybe an incremental year or two. But that has to be counterbalanced with a question from the health insurance companies of how much are they willing to pay to add on average one or two more years to your life. So there's this trade-off that happens. The machine learning model doing a calculation underneath that then impacts the business decision on top. Kind of scary when you think all of this through. Let, let me ask you this. What, what were you seeking to gain 
uh, by writing the ultimate price, Professor? You know, for me, when I when I see something that intrinsically seems unfair, then I want to address it. When I see an opportunity that perhaps people are not aware of, I want to share that because I do have a belief that a well-informed public can drive positive change. The original impetus for me was back in the September 11th Victims Compensation Fund. Uh, that decision to implement it itself was very controversial. But the payments themselves, I found problematic. For me, it was troubling to see government money being paid to then have such a massive range, a 30x range. And in fact, the largest payments went to someone who was alive, over $8 million, not even the families of people who died. So that it started with that concern, but then learning more about the process. Kenneth Feinberg himself was dissatisfied with the process. He had had constraints, and he himself stated that he felt that it wasn't the best approach. He said, given the opportunity, a fair approach, easier to administer and more acceptable to the public would have been to value all lives equally. And I found that inspiring. Uh, I was further inspired by the fact that later he had the opportunity to revisit this. Uh, following the One Boston Fund creation after the Boston Marathon bombing, he was again special administrator. This time there was no constraints on how he spent the money. And he implemented exactly what he said he thought was fair. He paid the families of the victims the same amount of money, regardless of whether they were richer, poor, older, young, regardless of race, regardless of sex, all lives were valued the same. And that's not always the perfect solution, but I think it's a much better starting point than starting with something such as income, which is very much dependent on many other factors. Yeah, it, it, it is very disturbing to realize, you know, after reading your book, um, you, you go shopping maybe. You're in a major mall and you're looking at people and you're looking at them differently. You're now suddenly realizing that there's a dollar sign above all their heads and it's not the same dollar sign. And that is very disturbing. But, you know, it's not unusual for people, not, not just business marketing to to um, insurance companies, but for people themselves to actually value um, other people differently. There are cultures like in India, for example, where they value a male child much more than a female child. Indeed, you write on page 150 of your book, quote, one single decision to select for a boy may seem innocuous, but millions of individuals making the same choice can lead to collective disaster, close quote. Um, first, two-part question. I'd like you to unpack what disaster you're talking about. And then second, this is a choice about a male or a female child, but isn't it also true of how we subdivide the value of life in every other area. Please, sir. So it's a, it's a great example. And, you know, what I was getting to in that particular point was that you end up with a, what's called the tragedy of the commons. The, the individual decision doesn't seem so uh, substantial. But when tens of millions of people make the same directional decision, you end up in the cases of some countries, with a huge imbalance in the number of girls versus boys. And you have the issues associated with that in terms of political stability, economic stability, social stability, besides the other factor which happens, which what starts out as a national issue, this imbalance, soon becomes a regional issue because neighboring countries start then looking to you know find partners there so you you end up basically with this this whole cascading set of issues but if we step back from that a little bit you you had mentioned i think a very interesting point which was the fact that there are all these different groups putting different price tags on human life and 
I'd like to go back to that 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 idea of looking at the extreme examples for a second, because it's much more perverse at the international level. We probably uh, remember clearly Union Carbide and the gas leak. Uh, in Bhopal, India, about 4,000 people died back in 1984. There was a settlement. The settlement was $60,000 per victim. The victims were in India. Now, at that time, that was a low-income country. I think now it's classified as a lower-middle-income country. But still, there's no question that per capita income is substantially lower than places in the United States. Additionally, the legal protections are different in the different countries. So take that example from 1984 of $60,000 per victim. Fast forward in time to the last few years. Now, obviously, we need to do what's called a inflationary adjustment. Right. But we think about the Toyota car acceleration failures. So Toyota was well aware that there were issues with their acceleration system. In the United States, less than 100 people were killed because of this issue. Yet, the Toyota company ended up having to pay in regulatory fines and civil fines approximately $20 million per victim. So, a couple years ago, the United States, $20 million per victim. 1984 in India, 60,000. Some of that is the difference in time, but a lot of that is the locations. So what does that send as a message? It sends a message to companies. If you want to do something riskier, do it in a country where there are less protections, where human life is less valued. What was the message that was sent to every care organization in New York after the Cheryl Thurston? It said, no matter what you do, your negligence will not be punished. If you do something terribly wrong and someone staying at your care facility dies, have no fear. The settlement will likely be zero. It sends a message. By the way, that message was reinforced. I live in New York. Of course, we had, uh, and still, of course, in the challenges of the COVID, but we had that tremendous COVID uh, peak in March and April and May. Right. Well, during that time, a, a very large percentage of the people who died were in care facilities, nursing homes. They have lawsuit protection. They will not end up losing money or going out of business because they failed to protect the people that they were supposed to be caring for. All those COVID deaths, they will not, the families will not get compensated from the care facility. Why? The message has already been sent. Those lives are not valued. You know, I, I've, I've got sheets of additional questions here, but we're getting short on time. And so I'm just going to I'm going to ask you this. As I said at the top of the show, we like to know three things. We know two of those. What we what we know is who the messenger is and what the message is. And, and I want everybody to read this book because we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. But the big question, how do we use this information how do we go forward? What do we do with it, Professor? My suggestion is get informed, get involved. Uh, you know, we started out with this idea of reinforcement learning, you know, being in this circular part. Well, I think people who are non-scientists present a great group to introduce a different perspective. So as you read, for example, Ultimate Price and you hear about the details inside these algorithms, People should understand what's happening. You don't have to be a scientist to understand the at a high level what are the key inputs and assumptions. You just need someone to explain to you what's happening in the equations. But when you see something that's unfair, unjust, challenge it. Because maybe what's happening is a group of technicians, technocrats, politicians, scientists have come up with their own solution and they haven't actually seen a broader perspective. They haven't gotten outside of that group think. So I think that's really the opportunity for non-scientists to add value is to give that new perspective, that fresh perspective. 
All right, sir, please, in 30 seconds, tell everybody how they can learn more about you. If you have a blog, the blog, your website again, where they can get your book. Thank you again. It's, first of all, it's been a real pleasure. I'm so thankful to be here. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to howard Friedman.com, and uh, we have some materials on there, lots of other uh, videos and audios where I discuss different concepts. Uh, I do also actively uh, post information on LinkedIn, so feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. You can always find me by just looking up Howard Friedman and Columbia University. All right, and if you do a search, not, unlike my fact checker, make sure it's Howard Stephen Friedman that you're searching for to get that additional <laughs> or, information. Or, or, ju or just look for Howard Freeman and Columbia University, and then, then you'll be at the right one. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you for sharing your work and your experiences with us, Professor, and we wish you the very best in your endeavors to come. All right, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show. Learn something. We'll join us again next week, same time, same place. Until then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.